This is AHA Business Radio, creating AHA moments for business, by business, and about business, providing opportunities to discover information to help you run your business and guide your decision making. The more you know, the better decisions you make. AHA Business Radio is produced by Alan Hirsch Advisors. For more information, log on to ahabusinessradio.com. To join in tonight's conversation, call 410-481-1300. Now, here's your host for AHA Business Radio, Alan Hirsch. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's show. Tonight, I have a... uh, I will be spotlighting four business owners in the Baltimore area. Uh, Louise Zaretta of Apical uh, Research Team, Edward Steinberg of J.S. Edwards Fine Men's Clothing, Brett Cohn of Kitchen Saver, and Eric uh, Osterwick, Fells Point Wholesale Meats. Uh, In the studio with me first is Loretta Zaretta. You you said that before, just before we went (laughs) on. Louise Zaretta. (laughs) So I apologize, but we, she said people call her that, and I just did that. So I apologize. Yeah, uh, uh, so first of all, what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Oh, my. Uh, my clients motivate me because they always have uh, unmet needs that I'm supposed to anticipate and enjoy anticipating. Uh, the people that work for me are waiting for me to inspire them and get work processed. And, uh, I, you know, it's it's a high level of energy when you run a business. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your business. What what do you do? We do medical and healthcare market research, not to be confused with clinical research. We look at pre-launch specialty pharmaceutical drugs. That means drugs before the FDA has approved them. And they're specialty pharmaceutical drugs, which means they're injectable, infusible, expensive drugs for nasty diseases. And we are these uh, to say are these what some people call widow drugs? Or could no, they be? you're thinking orphan drugs. Orphan drugs. Orphan drugs. No, no, no. Orphan drugs are drugs uh, for diseases that small numbers of people okay. have. Um, these are drugs like. Um, uh, cancer drugs, uh, Crohn's disease, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So they're uh, drugs for uh, diseases that many people have, but they're injectable and fusible. It's not something you fill usually at your corner pharmacy. Okay. So how'd you get into this? Well, it was a very circuitous route. Uh, I started out uh, in, goodness, in journalism and writing and human resources and public relations. And ultimately, an executive recruiter took me into healthcare, And then another executive recruiter, recruiter took me into uh, market research. And there it's been. So when did you send, you know, so that was obviously the, a recruiter took you into another bit to a company. Twice, yes. Twice. So how did you then from there decide and what motivated you to start your own business? Well, I think every industry that I'm aware of has gone through tremendous change in the last 20 years. So whether you're talking about airlines, there's just no end to the list of industries. And my industry, market research, was going through tremendous change because the small companies were being gobbled up by the large companies. And with that came the loss of some of the client connectivity that really, really got me excited about working with my pharmaceutical clients. So I felt that there was a niche that was underserved, and that's the niche of market access, which means managed care. And no one really had kept up with. There are very few of us who who were able to keep up with the changes in moving drugs into the marketplace after the FDA approves them. They need to be commercially successful. So I... They just don't need to cure people, but they... Doctors have to prescribe them. Hospitals have to use them. And more importantly, managed care has to reimburse. They have to pay for them. So you can have great drugs that never are commercially successful. And you can have so-so drugs or Me Too drugs that have a lot of market share because the pharmaceutical company contracted well with managed care. So I went out and uh, talked with... hmm, Three of my best friends, more or less, three individuals over the years uh, that I had worked with that I thought were top notch in their field. You know when you're in a field who's good and who's just sort of coasting. 
and two are doctors, and uh, two of us are MBAs, and the confluence of our skill set is what... So is how what long have you been in business? Now? 12 years. 12, 12 years. years. So the, it's just the four of you. Yes. And you haven't grown. It's just been, really been the four of you from the beginning. We do highly specialized work. It's been uh, the four of us from the beginning. There were one or two others that we kind of tried out in the beginning and didn't work. We are, in essence, I like to describe us as a huge Venn diagram. Each one of us has unique skill sets. And when they cross over in the center, it works. That's what makes it work. So how do you go about, I mean, getting, getting clients? I guess it's specialized, and so, but how do you go about getting clients? A lot of it is word, by, word of mouth and uh, by reputation. And because we are a niche player, we are not looking to compete with the huge market research companies. We are looking to do what we do, market access, managed care, better than anyone else. And because... One of the physicians that uh, is a key principal with us was the former medical director of a Blue Cross plan. He knows what managed care needs to make good uh, contracting decisions. Another doctor, one of our other doctors, is um, a health economics and outcomes research. He understands the clinical aspects of drug uh, uh, drug efficacy and safety. And uh, the other person that's an MBA, I'm an MBA, the other MBA, understands strategic decision making for the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, one, how do you go about, and it, it, since you're a niche company, how do you go about marketing or really targeting the pharmaceuticals or the drugs? Or, or is it everything referral or you really go after some of the uh, major pharmaceuticals. Just remind everybody that if you have any questions for Louise or myself, give us a call at 410-481-1300. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, of course, we had to market ourselves. Um, I uh, chaired, co-chaired an industry conference, and I put my people uh, in key positions at the conference, and we <laughs> had lots of business cards, <laughs> and then and there we got our first client, and she has still been a client 12 years later. Um, once we started uh, doing... Those are the kind of clients most of us would like to have. Yes. Once we started doing some really specialized projects, uh, there was shifting within the industry. Uh, people moved to different pharmaceutical companies. They called us when they got to their new positions. Well, yeah, they, they worked with you one, X place and they went to Y place and they knew what you could do. So, so it, it grew from referral Exactly. Basically from who you knew. And we are very active uh, in the uh, managed market field. So the physician that used to be the head of a Blue Cross plan, a medical director of a Blue Cross plan, he was the first uh, medical director ever elected to the board of the AMCP, the American Managed Care Pharmacy Board. So th there is visibility within uh, our, our field, and people recognize that if you need managed care access work done, we're the people to call. So you, you're, you're, you're a sense, you're, and, and I think things go in cycles when all the marketing companies buy up and then little ones come, boutiques come out and do the, and, and you've really been a successful boutique or niche, niche player in the pharmaceutical marketing right. over the last, uh, I think you said, 12 years. Yes. Uh, so what is a decision you might have made that didn't go so well that you learned from? Well, I think there's always human resources issues. And we, as I mentioned, we tried some other uh, associates in the beginning. And if you are going to put forth a certain amount of expertise, you better be sure that those of you that are involved have the expertise and share the values. I would say the most important part of what's kept our team together is sharing values. It could be that a client needs something first thing in the morning. Nobody says, well, you know, it's already 10 o'clock at night. We do what it takes to get the job done, and we share, we share common values to get the work done at a certain level of competency. So you're, you're, you're very much customer service oriented. The customer yeah. needs something, they get it. Absolutely. Or, or they are told that we can't get it. No, no, we get it. Okay. Okay, you get it. Uh, very quickly, if you were meeting with somebody who was going into the kind of business you're in, what one piece of advice would you give them? 
Uh, I would tell them that if you have a unique selling proposition, you know, a niche, highly expertise, high expertise in that niche, go for it. Just go for it because true expertise is hard to find. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, so, uh, Louise, how can people reach you? Uh, we have a, a website. It's uh, apicalresearch.com, A-P-I-C-A-L research.com. Or I can be called at uh, 443-831-8014. Again, Louise, thank you very much. I appreciate your being here. Uh, uh, when we come back from the commercial break, I will have Ed Edward Steinberg from J.S. Edwards, Fine Men's Clothing. Later in the show, I have the AHA Business Trivia Contest. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and this is AHA Business Radio on CBS Sports Radio, 1300 AM. Now back to AHA Business Radio, creating AHA moments for business, by business, and about business. Once again, here's your host, Alan Hirsch. Well, welcome back to the show. This segment, I will be talking with uh, Edward Steinberg, uh, the owner of J.S. Edwards Fine Men's Clothing in Pikesville. Uh, Edward, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thanks for having us here today. It's my pleasure. What motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Well, I think it's uh, the retail experience changes every day. You you really can't predict what's going to happen that day in terms of uh, your customer base, your um, your staff, you know, their merchandise coming in. It's always exciting. You know, we we have um, a higher end men's clothing store in Pikesville, located at the Festival at Home Shopping Center. So. Uh, we feel that we're every day we have a challenge to outfit a customer with a, a need that they have, either for a business outfit or a casual outfit. So that's always exciting to say what's going to happen today. So how did you get started? And it's been several decades. So how did you get started? Exactly. Um, I attended University of Baltimore, and I, I graduated there also. While I was going to college, I worked for a store called Young's Men's Store, which was in Hamilton. They started out... Uh, in the late 40s, and I got there in 1966 and stayed for 17 years. So I started out as a stock room and then ended up as a, a buyer and saw an opportunity when uh, a store had closed in Pikesville, and we opened the location, which was the Hilton, which is the Doubletree Inn now on Rushtown Road. And my wife and I said, you know, I think we could do this. Where the store closed, we thought we'd have a customer-based and uh, explore beyond that and change the store and continued. And that's what we did. And we moved to our new location about 28 years ago. So today, I'm, I know there are a lot of challenges that retailers face. So what are some of the, uh, for you, the biggest challenges you've faced over the last 33 years of, of your business? Well, I think uh, the last probably five to eight years has really been the biggest challenge. And that's probably been uh, e-commerce against brick and mortar. Um, it's changed the attitude of the consumer. It's changed the way people buy, their habits of buying. And I think that is really going to be the challenge in the future of brick and mortar retailing. So that's the challenge. How do you or how do you suggest retailers like you overcome that challenge? Well, I think the most important thing is define who your customer is and be able to properly service your customer no matter what you're selling. And find that marketplace that there still is a need for that consumer. Not everyone shops online. So there's you know, still a good portion of the marketplace that still needs to come in, touch, feel, smell, try on, whatever. Uh, interesting story uh, I heard the other day from actually uh, Tom Squell, who is president of Maryland Retailer Merchants Association of Maryland. And he told me that he's a gardener and that um, his son for Christmas – ordered him a rake online. I said, how do you order a rake online? He got a rake as a Christmas gift. I said, don't you have to come in and touch it and feel it and try it and see the balance of it? But today, retail has changed, so you can buy a rake online. So, I mean, really, what, you know, uh, having myself not been in retail and not dealing with many retailers in what I do, uh, what is it that you do that brings, you know, you, you're still seven, eight years after the biggest challenges as with this e-commerce. What are some of the things that you really do that keep your customers coming back and uh, over and over again to buy the 
well, the clothing I, from you. Yeah, I think it's uh, fulfilling a need for a customer where, um, case in point, in men's clothing, it's something that uh, has to be tailored, has to be altered, has to be tried on, has to be fitted. Uh, we have in-house tailoring in our store. We have a staff where the average uh, person has worked in the store about 22 years. Um, it's a, we're part of the community. Um, we live, we shop, we uh, work in the community of Pikesville. And uh, we try to service that need of that customer, whatever it is. If it's, someone's going on a business trip tomorrow and they need that suit tomorrow, we'll get it done. So that you know is probably the most important thing is servicing the customer in a way that's so important to them that they really feel that you have done them service that they're going to continue to come back time and time again. Because the one thing I know we don't get is the kind of service that retailers like yourself give from the internet. Well, that's true. And the other thing I think that we try to provide is we are a fashion-based store. We're not um, a store that I would say is uh, in the realm of mainstream clothing for men. Uh, we, we feel, we, you know, we only cater to a small portion of percentage population because of the taste level and because of the, the pricing of our garments. So we feel that we need to choose garments specifically for our customers. You know, we don't have buyers in Seattle buying things for people in, in Baltimore. We're, we're actually going, the buyer and myself, go to the marketplace probably uh, 12, 15 times a year, either in New York or in Los Angeles or in Las Vegas, to select specifically for certain customers in mind. Oh, you know what? I think, I think uh, Mr. Joe uh, King is going to love this suit. I think we're going to select this fabric for him. Well, before uh, the next question, I just want to remind the listeners, I'm Alan Hirsch, and I'm talking to Edward Steinberg of J.S. Edwards Fine Men's Clothing. If you have any questions about clothing or how to dress, please give us a call, 410-481-1300. So you, you, you do a lot uh, to make sure your customers are, are happy that you're servicing your, your clients and providing them what I would, I would call the goods and service, the, the product, the clothes that they want, not necessarily they need. We used to call it the carriage trade. Okay. That's <laughs> it's a terminology in, in retail, you know, for uh, everything for the customer, you know, to, to be able to white glove service, if you want to say. In 33 years, can you give me a, a tell me a story uh, about something that, that you had planned and tried to do that didn't work and what you learned from it? Um, I, there was a, a plan that... Uh, Probably about 20 years ago, I had an idea to open up another type of store. And uh, it was uh, probably predated an ar Under Armour type concept, with, which was sweats. The, it was actually called the sweatshop. And I thought about 25 years ago that there was going to be a market for casual uh, uh, fleece type wear. And I partnered with some people and we opened quite a few stores and uh, it didn't work out at all. So I learned a lot of lessons from it you know, to come back to what I, I thought I could do best, my wife could do best, and continue that and build on it, expand on it, and just fine-tune it. So your, your lesson was, is, uh, for you, was to stick to your niche. Exactly. So, so what, el what else do you do to make sure that your, your customers and, your, and I guess your staff, you have staff of longstanding that you mentioned one, so someone 22 years? Well, the average is 22. The longest has been, uh, as long as we've been in business, he's part-time, he's 33. We have two others who have been uh, 25 and 32. And we have two younger candidates. One's been about a year and the other one about two years. Hmm. So Taylor's been there about five years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so... Uh, so what are some, some thoughts and processes that you would suggest to people? People still want to go into retail in this country. They do. It's still a, a terrific, uh, challenging, exciting uh, field. Uh, and I think the most important thing is to have a plan. You know, what is your plan to, uh, let's say, open up a storefront or to start a business, even if it's uh, as simple as going to uh, a yard sale or, or to set up at uh, – uh, like a storefront somewhere, I think you have to have a plan. What is your product? How are you going to fulfill that product to the consumer? What's your financing? How long can you do this for without working, let's say, another job? Should you quit your job? All these things are important. And there's all types of um, 
uh, career centers. There's Baltimore County, Baltimore and Maryland State, Maryland retailers offers, you know, counseling for people that want to go. Well, there the are incubators there uh, in Baltimore County. There's an uh, what, what's it called over at Baltimore? It, it's housed in the Baltimore County Chamber of Commerce for those who economic, want to uh, the economic development. Right. But it's exactly. for new biz, new businesses. There's a small business administration. Right. Take advantage of all those. Uh, take yeah. advantage of all of those. Absolutely. And there is funding. Uh, within within the state government, I mean, most people don't realize that one and a half percent of the state's lo- uh, gambling revenue from the casinos goes to a fund to support for, small, support small small, biz- small businesses in the state of Maryland. Correct. I mean, really do your homework. I mean, try you know talk to other businesses. You know, try to get a sense of what is if you feel there is a need. You know, I think the biggest. Uh, misnomer is that people open up businesses because they can't find, let's say, clothing that they like. So they say, I'm going to open up a business because I can't find what I like in clothing. Uh, it's probably the worst reason to. Well, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in, in that you either you have to have a passion for what you're doing. Correct. And a dream of where it's going to take you. And if you don't have that, those two things, I don't believe you'll be successful. And there have been a lot of people out you. there that have created businesses like Under Armour in his mother's basement. Correct. Uh, that he didn't have the money. He had a dream and a passion for what he's doing. It's, it's now, the, I think it's one of the largest, the, the largest uh, company housed in the Baltimore metropolitan area. And, and, and also there, there was a need. And he right. saw there was a need and fulfilled right. that. Well, I want to uh, thank you for being here. Uh, how can our guests reach you if they want to reach you? Uh, J.S. Edwards Men's Clothing is located at the Festival at Wood Home Shopping Center, which is Town Road and Beltway Exit 20. Our phone number, 410-653-2266. You can visit our website at www.jsedwards.com. We've been voted Baltimore's best for 15 years, consecutive years, by Baltimore Magazine, recognized Baltimore County. Also was chosen Esquire Magazine, one of the top men's store in the country. Well, that, that's a great record. Again, I want to thank you for be, being here. As I go to the commercial break, I have the traffic update. And when we come back, I will be talking to Brett Cohn, the owner of Kitchen Savers. Later in the show, I will have the AHA Business Trivia Contest. I'm Alan Hirsch, and this is AHA Business Radio on CBS Sports Radio 1300 AM. Now back to AHA Business Radio, creating AHA moments for business, by business, and about business. Once again, here's your host, Alan Hirsch. Uh, welcome back to the show. My guest this segment is Brett Cohn. He's the owner of Kitchen Savers in uh, the Baltimore area. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments for uh, Brett or myself, give us a call 410-481-1300. So, Brett, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Alan. I'm glad you could be here. What motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, at the end, of, at the beginning of the day, and at the end of the day, it really comes down to my family. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, my beautiful wife, my child, my soon to be here child coming in September. I, I want to provide for them, um, and that's for me as a family man. But I assume that you probably want to know my opinion as an entrepreneur. What motivates me as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What motivates you to get up and go to work? Well, it's really the thrill of every day changing ever so slightly and being able to affect change on a on a grander scale. It's about being able to really work with a wonderful team of people and be able to cultivate a community, being able to create something, being able to come up with great suggestions, solutions, and ideas. And like I said, really being able to work with a phenomenal team like we have at Kitchen Saver that provide great customer experiences every day. So what does Kitchen Kitchen Saver do? Well, besides, I know it saves kitchens, but, (laughs) but, you know, it's not like saving someone that's drowning in the ocean. But uh, what is it that you as a business do? Well, Kitchen Saver is a 30 plus year kitchen remodeling firm that specializes in refacing cabinets. And when I talk about refacing cabinets, we actually are able to keep the existing cabinet itself, replace the doors, the drawer boxes, add accessories. We're even able to add custom pieces to the kitchen itself because we have our own custom shop in-house. The idea is that when we're done, it doesn't look like a reface. It looks like a brand new kitchen. And that's why we've won so many awards. At the end of the day, you want it to look beautiful, and we're often able to save the customer anywhere from a third to a half on a full kitchen remodel. 
So how did you get started in this business? Uh, the easiest way in the world. I married into it. <laughs> uh, my father-in-law. Sounds like me. I was born into mine. So <laughs> you, you, you know, But you, you married into it. Okay. Uh, uh, as uh, you know, my wife, Julie, her father uh, has been in this business over 30 plus years. Um, and Andy had approached me and asked me to come on board with the company. And uh, to be quite honest with you, I was not comfortable with that. Um, and what, after- what was having been someone myself in a family business and working with a number of families, what, what made you feel uncomfortable? Well, you know, I'm actually from New York originally and I grew up on Long Island and I have a lot of friends. And one of the things about me is my, my father was a government employee. My mother worked for a corporation and we grew up in a very nice area, but we weren't part of the super, you know, wealthy people in our area. There were a lot of them and a lot of uh, family owned businesses. And I had a lot of friends who had this, but they all, there was a strong sense of entitlement. And I saw a lot of people inherit companies and put them, basically put them under within a few years because it was more about the entitlement and not about the work and not about building something. And I like to create and I like to build. And it was also this fear at the same time about taking somebody else's baby and raising them and, and, and growing them. And the bottom line is you're working with your father-in-law. You know, you already are with his daughter. You've got to work with him every day in that regard as well. So how do you create that work-life balance? And that was another fear I had. So, Well, I, I would suggest here, and without going to, that it's not about work-life balance. It's about the quality of what you do in each of those parts of your absolutely, life. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's not a balancing act that you're going to be 50% family, 50% work. That's balance. But it's really about making sure the quality of what you do is uh, with your family and the quality of time and the quality of time you spend in the work uh, create that uh, uh, life, a better life. Absolutely. And one of the most incredible things is I am very blessed. I have an incredible set of in-laws. Everyone, Some people don't like spending time with their in-laws. I love spending time with my in-laws. I'm very close with my in-laws. My father-in-law... I didn't want to affect that relationship in a bad way by coming to the company and not living up to his expectations. Um, and in the end, we he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And No I, horses in the bed. No horses in the in bed. bed. But anyway. So you're before, quoting our favorite movie. <laughs> yes. But before, I just want to remind everybody, I'm Alan Hirsch, and I'm talking to Brett Cohn of Kitchen Savers. If you have any questions, give us a call, 410-481-1300. And it, you used the phrase you were worried about. You had a great relationship with your your in laws, uh, and I remember when I my father first approached me, my senior year in college, about coming into the family business. My biggest fear was we had a great relationship, and you hear stories all the time about how fathers of sons or fathers and in laws, the the business ruins those relationships, mm-hmm. and that was something I really feared. And I think my father will tell you, as I will, that. Our relationship today, 46, 46, I guess it's 46 years later, is stronger than it was back then when I was in college. So, uh, and so he made you an offer you couldn't refuse. Absolutely. And, and uh, back then we also had another company called Bath Fitter. So we had a bathroom company and a kitchen company, Kitchen Saver. And Kitchen Saver was a lot smaller then. Um, but Andy made the greatest decision in the world. He started me in the warehouse. I was sweeping floors. I was doing inventory. I was working with installers. And I had that time, that valuable amount of time to really learn the company from the ground up. There wasn't any department he didn't put me in. It was almost like an apprentice program for a few years where before he threw me out into the world of sales, because that's what he basically said, okay, you've done this, you've run in our marketing department, you've done the call center, you've worked in our warehouse on installation. Now it's time for you to go out and sell. So on this date, you're going to be hundred percent commission. Here's your samples go out. <laughs> and, um, I'll tell you, I thought that was going to be one of the scariest days of my life because hundred percent commission. Oh my, oh my, what am I going to do? I'll tell you what really was probably one of the scariest days was today. He said, okay, Brett, now I need to bring you in for management. So you need to come back and work for me in the company as a manager. I'm like, wait a minute. I can't be a salesman anymore. Cause I love sales. I loved being able to affect that change in a positive way for customers. And along the way, we started focusing a little bit more on kitchen saver and the bath company was doing very well, 
But the kitchen company was producing a nice living, but nowhere near what it is today. And we just saw a lot of potential. We had a great um, base here in Baltimore, um, but we were starting to expand in Maryland and Northern Virginia, very slowly in Northern Virginia at that time. And over the course of time, started taking over more of a role, doing more marketing down there, pushing uh, more research into the area and seeing where, what areas in Montgomery County and in Northern Virginia would be very successful for us and also focusing on more of our marketing efforts and resources. Um, and four years ago, just a week and a half ago, is uh, the day that I bought the company from Congratulations. Andy. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's surreal in many ways. Uh, the, uh, the fact of the matter is every day I feel a sense of responsibility for my employees and my customers. Um, the idea is that we really try to treat people like they're family. And I do believe that if you treat your employees like family and really like gold, then they're going to treat your customers like diamonds. Well, the, the Simon Sinek, who I follow a lot, who's the founder of the Why, Start With Why, which you and I have talked about offline Absolutely. before, he says if, you're, if your employees don't love your customers, your customers won't. Absolutely. There's no question. And I will tell you the reviews that we get on Angie's List, the reviews that we get on the internet – on Google and just the satisfaction rating that we get from our customers is higher than average because of that. We don't subcontract. We actually keep our employees. Most home improvement companies believe in the theory of using subs, 1099s. They all use this line company employee, company installers. Well, they're not. And there's a big difference for the consumer because it's, it's not going to help the consumer when that contractor goes out of business or that sub goes out of business so they don't show up. I control the entire process. And because of that, we're there every step of the way. We're never going to be perfect, and that's okay. We're going to make mistakes just like anybody else. But to me, the measure of a good company is what happens when a mistake happens. We're there to fix it, and we fix it right away, and we do the job right. That's what Kitchen Saver is all about. So uh, we're pretty much running – just very quickly, how can the listeners reach you if they are interested in saving their kitchens? Sure. Uh, best way to do it is go to our website, www.kitchensaver.com, and also our phone number, and I'll use the local number right now, 410-363-8283. Either way. Well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time this evening. Uh, when we come back from the great break, I will have the AHA Business Trivia Contest. The winner will receive a gift certificate to the Capitol Grill, and I will be talking to Eric uh, Osterwick who's the owner of the Fells Point Wholesale Market. Uh, for those of you who graduated from City College in 1967, as I did, uh, we, were having, we are having our 50th reunion on June 25th at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. So if you're a member of that class, I will be there. I'd love to see you there. For information, go to cityforever.org backslash reunions. I look forward to seeing you there. I'm Alan Hirsch, and this is AHA Business Radio on CBS Sports Radio, 1300 AM. Now, back to AHA Business Radio, creating AHA moments for business, by business, and about business. And now it's time for tonight's AHA Trivia Question, where you can win great prices from the AHA Business Radio Show. Call 410-481-1300 if you know the answer. And now with tonight's AHA Trivia Question, here's your host, Alan Hirsch. Tonight's qu trivia question is, whose private library formed the foundation for the Library of Congress? You think you know the answer? Give us a call 410 481 1300 and the caller with the correct answer will receive a gift, gift gift certificate excuse me to the Capitol Grill one of my favorite restaurants downtown and I don't know whether he does or he doesn't but my guest this segment uh, is Eric Osterwick uh, who's the owner of Fells Point Wholesale Meats and he sells meats to a lot of the high-end restaurants country clubs and so forth in Baltimore so tell me a little bit about what you do as a meet. But before I do that, what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Well, I love my job. Uh, and that's and that's really important. I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, it's never it's never changed, really. Um, I still work plenty of hours. It's an early day because we ship out the stuff early to the restaurant. So, yes, I have to get up early. 
some of my staff gets up a lot earlier than we do. Uh, but before the sun goes up, I'm already there. And uh, sometimes when it's already down, I'm still there. But that doesn't happen very often. Uh, but it's a, uh, it's a great job. It's a profession I picked very early in life. Knew what I wanted to do at very early age. And I have uh, done it for myself for uh, almost 30 years. So how did you get started as uh, in the butchery? I know you were, you. well, why don't you tell us a little bit how you got started? And I know you didn't start in this country and what brought you here and, and that little bit of story, because I think it's a very interesting story. I born and raised in the Netherlands. I grew up there with five older brothers, my father and uh, my parents had a butcher shop and a cafeteria. And we grew up above it in the street in the city of The Hague. Um, I decided at very early age that uh, my follow my two oldest brothers and my father into the business, um, into the profession anyway. Started working at part time at my father's place, and uh, by the time I turned sixteen, I went to a vocational school, a, a butcher school, basically for four years. It was actually a six year program. Got offered a job in Washington D.C. by one of the meat wholesalers there, and uh, cut my study short to come here for a year. Is that a pun intended? You cut your, your yeah, study short much. so you uh, could cut meat. <laughs> well, no, it was, at at that rate back then we used to go to school two days a week and and cut meat four days a week oh, okay. for a butcher shop, and oh, okay. then it went to one day in five days. Okay, um, I basically stopped the studies and and intended to go back to Holland after a year, a year and a half, and then continue my school. That never happened because I'm still here. Huh. Uh, but I think I've made up for it by just learning it myself. And uh, it worked for this uh, this place in D.C. for about four and a half years, did a couple other things. And in 1988, uh, coming here in 82, I uh, opened up a little butcher shop in the Broadway market, uh, a little retail shop, and uh, that grew into a wholesale shop. And that's where my uh, partner, Leo Pryson, joined me. He's also a Dutch native, worked for the same company that I used to work for, and together we've grown this uh, this business into a uh, 50,000 square foot plant out, out on Ville Marco in southwest Baltimore. So uh, so tell me, you know, it, it's it's a business not many people know about. People go to restaurants and they eat meat, <laughs> right. and they order it. They really don't know how complicated it is to, to really get it from, from the farm to the stores, and, yeah. and you're an integral part of doing that. Uh, yes, it is, and there's a lot of integral parts of that. We uh, we already get it semi-processed, so we're not in the in the in the beginning process of it. It comes to us in boxes. We uh, mostly vacuum packed. We have a great farm program too, where we buy straight from the farms, and our trucks that are on the road making deliveries pick it up, bring it back to our building, which is USDA inspected refrigerate it right we process it to the needs of what our customers want uh, just like everything else so we further trim we're a further processor basically we trim we cut portion we do anything anything anybody wants and then pack it and put it on our trucks the next day or whenever they want it and we ship it to their uh, establishments okay just to remind the listeners before i continue talking with uh, Astra, er, eric osterwick uh the, quiz, the trivia question tonight is, uh, whose private library formed the foundation for the Library of Congress? Uh, and uh, please give us a call, 410-481-1300, if you know the answer. Uh, and you'll get the gift certificate to the Capitol Grill. Uh, so over these years, 88, it's almost 30 years now. Right. Uh, I'm sure you've made some decisions that didn't work out the way you thought they would. And I know we all learn from, we probably learn more from our errors and, than we do on it from doing something right. Uh, and I always ask guests a, a story of something that you thought was the right decision turned out wrong and what you learn from it. Well, and, and that's exactly the best way to learn. Uh, you learn to make better decisions. Uh, my parents taught us at very early age, uh, also because of out of necessity, they didn't really have a whole lot of time to spend with us. If you wanted to do something, you had to go do it. And if it didn't work out, then you had to do better the next time. And uh, very many small little side jobs that I had or little businesses that I got into kind of failed or I did things wrong or I didn't make any money at the end of the day. We learned a lot from that. That's not to be underestimated. Um, you know, at the end of the day, after 30 years of business, doing and learning at the same time, and hopefully you learn fast so you don't um, make the mistake two or three times, uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Okay. I have a caller, Rich. Rich, Rich, are you there? 
Hello, Rich. Zero zero one. Uh, Rich. Yes. You there? Yes. Uh, would you you calling for the trivia question? Yes. Uh, what's the, the so whose library formed the foundation for the Library of Congress? Uh, Thomas Jefferson. You're absolutely correct. Awesome. Uh, thank you for calling in. If you'll hold the line, my producer Joe will get your uh, uh, address and information so we can send you out that gift certificate in a day or two. Enjoy well, your you. enjoy your dinner at the Capitol Grill. I and, thank you very much. And, and thank you for calling. All righty. So we I interrupt in the middle, but but doing things. Yep, absolutely. Doing things and and uh, and you learn by making mistakes. And uh, today, unfortunately, you don't see that very often. Everybody wants to make sure that kids don't make mistakes. It is a very fast way of learning it. Just guide them, give them some uh, pointers, and let them go. I, I agree with you. You, you the teach your children uh, and employees and a good a good business leader. Uh, whether you do it is having someone else do it. Mm-hmm. The only absolutely. way they're going to learn and build trust is to do it themselves. And put them to work. And put them to work. Hard Whether work. In, in a great leader uh, trusts an employee to do the job, and if they make a mistake, it becomes a coaching and learning experience. That's right. That's right. And we do a lot of teaching at work. It's hard to find good employees for us. Good butchers are not to be found. Um, if there's any out there, <laughs> call me. You got a job. But it, it uh, we start with young, good people, kind-hearted people that – don't mind to work and want to learn a trade. But because it, butchering is hard work. Absolutely. It's very hard work. It gets paid well. We have great benefits. It, those are the good things about it. And, you know, standing on the corner is not going to pay the bills. So you want that kind of job. We'll take you in and we'll teach you. A lot of our butchers have a, a, a background in the kitchen somewhere. They worked as a cook or line cook or whatever it's, uh, at some point in their life. And they want to change uh, whatever they're doing. And they come to us and we'll teach them. And that's that's a long process, but uh, they get paid well for it. And it's something that can make you a good living down the road and uh, and, and be happy with it. So you, you really believe in taking care of your employees? Oh, absolutely. It's so, a very important. We have a very little turnover. Uh, so you've had employees there for a number of years? 20, 25 years. Absolutely. And we've been in business, uh, including the, the, the retail. And there are no employees at this point from that. But from the day we started in wholesale... Uh, we still have some of those employees. Uh, very little employees leave us. And a lot of times if they leave, they leave themselves because they feel they don't fit in. And then it's a good thing. Uh, we've, we've created a culture, which I'm very proud of. And we all of us created that together to where it's teamwork, it's, it's hard work, but we all need to get it done and nobody quits before we're done. Um, but it's a constant learning, learning factor. So if, if you were talking to, and, and you're the, the immigrant that started a, a small business, a small retail, and I think 350, 400 square, square feet, feet of space, right. today it's, how big 50, is your, your 50,000 50, square feet mm-hmm. and a uh, uh, number, large number of employees. Having started as an entrepreneur almost 30 years ago, what is a tip or a thought or an idea that you think would be very important for someone to know or think about before they decided to go into business uh, as an art for themselves? Well, no matter what you want to do, make sure that you have enough knowledge of what you're going to do, that that's, that's going to get you where you want to be. You also should not be afraid to work hard. If, if you think you can do something and not work hard, well, then let me know what it is because that's magic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, undercapitalized. You see that a lot. People go into business, and by the time they open the doors, they don't have a penny. Uh, That's very difficult. Um, You know, back then I started with very little money. I think my total investment was fifteen thousand dollars into the Fells Point meat market. Uh, But I knew from day one, if I didn't sell a piece of meat, I could take it home and eat it. So, but but I think the one thing I say, and I'll put it, is that, and I actually said it in the last segment, uh, and you had a dream and a passion. Mm-hmm. When you started Absolutely. it, Absolutely. you didn't have the wealth. Mm-hmm. You had a dream and the passion, yep. and using that with the resources you had, you've made you've built a very successful business. Absolutely, and th- and that's a big difference too. If you don't have a passion for it, I'm not sure if it's going to last. I've been doing this so long, and it's still lasting, and we're still growing, and we're still moving ahead. Don't sell. 
don't stand still because then you go backwards. That was another thing I learned very uh, very early in life. And it's not what you make, it's what you do with it. Those are very important little things and don't ever forget it. Well, thank you for those tips. And uh, how can uh, listeners reach you if they're interested, uh, particularly restaurants and play list in, in acquiring meat? But how can people reach you if they want more information? Uh, they need to know the, fa- the phone number. You can go to fpwmeats.com. F as a Frank, P as a Paul, W as a wholesale, meats.com. Um, and you can call us directly from there, 410-539-5600. Well, Eric, thank you very much for being here. I want to thank my producer, Joe. Also, my videographer, Larry Wilner of LW BizFlix. Please join me next Tuesday at 6 p.m. when my guests will be here regarding the Small Business Administration's Awards Week. I will have Brian, Brian LePage, uh, who's representing... Th- works for a bank, but working with the awards committee. Uh, Cara DiPietro, who's the Small Business Person of the Year. Uh, Delilah, this, and I can't pronounce this, who's a minority-owned small business. D-Z-I-R-A-S-A is her last name. And we're going to be discussing the Small Business Award luncheon. I'd love to see you all there. Uh, I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors. This has been AHA Business Radio on CBS Sports Radio, 1300 AM. Thank you.